Psalm 128, 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to share the word here for just a minute. Before we do that, I want to show just a little clip of a video from, a, from two years ago. This was actually in 2019 at the Karis Bible Family Conference. And uh, it is an amazing hour and a half, but I'm going to share just a couple minutes of it. About our nation. About our nation. The, the 4th of July, and uh, we have limited time, so let's, let's go because this is a spot that people across the globe would crawl over cut glass and barbed wire and float in leaky boats just to be where we are. And so we need to understand what it is. You understand that, that if a company on one side, if a car dealership on one corner and a car dealership on another corner, one's prospering and one's failing, there's a reason. If there's a factory on one corner and a factory on another corner, one's failing, one's succeeding. There's, if a church on one corner and a church on another corner, one's failing, one, there's a reason. When there's a country on one side of a river that's prospering and a country on the other side of the river that's failing, there's a reason. And it's important that we know why that is because when we, uh, when we do things that uh, destroy that, uh, we, well, it's just not a right thing to do. What about this place? 4% of the population of the world call themselves Americans. Every year they write more bush, books, more plays, more symphonies, more copyrights, more inventions than the other 96% combined. Why? For thousands of years people hoped to someday fly. It was Americans that invented the airplane and the light bulb and the telegraph and the telephone, the global positioning system. If you, you put a a collar with a little chip in. A little girl in Poland, in Warsaw, loses her puppy dog. She can take an iPhone, go on the internet, through the GPS, find exactly where her puppy dog is. All of it conceived, invented, and maintained by Americans. Half of all the people on earth live on less than $2 a day. Half of those live on less than $1 a day. The second richest spot on earth is Western Europe, France, Germany, Britain. In America, we have a level below which we will not permit a person to sink. You come here, wave your foreign flag, put your feet up on the gripe and complain about the country. We will bury you with stamps for food, a roof over your head, a bed to sleep in, unlimited health care for you and anybody you've ever met, unlimited education, a person living in poverty in America. This is not my opinion. This is the Rector study done by the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal done every 24 months for the past 37 years. A person living in poverty in America is more likely to have a telephone, a television, an air conditioner, an automobile, eats more meat, and has more square footage space than the average resident of the second richest spot on earth, Western Europe. The question would be, why? This place blesses people as none other. All over the world there are skyscrapers. Why? Because an American named Elisha Otis, invented the elevator. And there are places where it's 100, 120 degrees. Why? Because an American named Willis Carrier, God love him, invented the air conditioner. <laughs> they made a ship parking in, in Singapore at this very moment is using a GPS a global positioning system conceived, invented, and maintained by Americans. No other nation on earth could send men to the moon. As they circle the moon, would read that in the beginning it was God who created the heavens and the earth. As they land on the moon, would take communion in recognition of Christ shedding his blood for all mankind. There's never been a place like this place. And whenever anybody's in trouble, they, who do they call? When a ship is attacked on the high seas, it's happened over 300 times last year, it's happened repeatedly in the last month, as you've seen, to whom do they appeal? The 327,000 Americans that wear the uniform of the United States Navy. If it weren't for them, there would be no peace or stability. You couldn't take your yacht and go across the Mediterranean for fear that somebody would get you, but they know that there's Americans. Now, as a result, America has done good for people. And it blesses folks. And uh, that puts it in the line of fire. And I'll just tell you this, quite frankly. America's not under attack because it's evil. America's under attack because it's good. 
85 cents out of every dollar that goes for the cost of global evangelism. My, my daughter went, spent a year in Rwanda where 80% of the people are Hutu, 20% are Tutsi, 80% tried to kill the 20% and did, killed, chopped a million people to death in 90, 90 days. And so the Americans have come in to try to bring some stability. And I went to visit her, and, and she, she would go down the street. She stopped in a little flower shop, and she ordered some flowers and said wanted to pick them up on the way back because she wanted to have them on the table for her parents. And when she walked out, she said, only an American can do that. They wouldn't trust anybody else to order flowers and not pay for them in advance. But they know that an American will keep its word. It can go. 85 cents out of every dollar. If you took all the money that goes for global evangelism, the people that are reaching the outreach, outreach to, to share the gospel, if you took the entire planet, put it all in a pile, and you increased it two, three, four, five, five and a half times, that's still not as much as Americans give. This is the lighthouse for the gospel. This is the place you take. And scripture says if you want to take a city, you have to bind a strong man. There's only one strong man in the world. It's the United States of America. You take America down, the rest of it is a piece of cake. Israel won't last a month. The fact is we are, as they call Israel, the little Satan. They call America the great Satan. America is under attack because it stands for righteousness. And when we, Christians separate themselves aside and allow this great lighthouse for the gospel to be turned over to people that, that don't approve of what we're doing, then we see what happens in South LA and in Chicago where 52 people were shot last Saturday night, Saturday and say, that's what happens when, when man abandons God. And so you and I need to be a part and our founders didn't want us to make an error. America is blessed. We are a blessed nation and it's what we're fighting for. There's a reason why we're a blessed nation. We're a blessed nation because a group of people who were Christians left tyranny to come and establish a nation of freedom. It really wasn't what they were set out to do, but when they got here, they decided they needed to. And they established a nation on freedom. And when they began to try to figure out how were they going to establish this nation different than any other, they got nowhere until they started seeking the face of God. And when they sought the face of God, they began to get a set of instructions of how to lead a country. We are a relatively young country, but yet we have the oldest government in the nation, in the world, I mean, oldest government in the world. All the other governments have turned over. They've changed the way they do government. There's even a nation that's tried to replicate our government, but was unsuccessful because they didn't incorporate God. They took God out. We, as people, are called to influence the culture. And I want to talk to you today about the church influencing the culture. And I just want to whet your appetite with a little bit of that video that is full of amazing stats and information. Um, it's an incredible video that I watched yesterday. We've been reading out of Psalm 128, and I want to read this verse to you again um, for just a minute. And it says this, How happy is everyone, say everyone, who fears the Lord, who fears the Lord, the one who has reverence and awe and honor toward the Lord. How happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You will surely eat what your hands have worked for. You will be happy and it will go well for you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like young olive trees around your table. In this very way, the man who fears the Lord will be what? Blessed. May the Lord bless you from Zion so that you will see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life and will see your children's children. Peace be with Israel. In verse 5 it said, May the Lord bless you from Zion. We've talked a little bit about how changing culture starts with me. It's an individual responsibility. How happy is everyone who fears the Lord. A man who brings honor of God in their life has an opportunity to influence and change the culture they live within. And then it says, the man who honors God and who fears the Lord will sit around his table and he will begin to change the culture of his family. He'll begin to influence them and he'll have a wife who's a fruitful vine and children who are like young olive trees. That's a beautiful thing if you didn't know. It's a good thing. And so the family influences culture and really the church influences culture. In verse 6 where it says, may the Lord bless you 
from Zion. Zion was where the temple was. It was where they would go to worship God. Let's go up to Zion and worship God. It represents that place where I go to meet with God and the people that would gather there and that group of people became known as the church that they would go to Zion. And so it's the church that God uses to accomplish his kingdom principles on the earth. The church. You and me together, united together along with all of the other believers, because the church is not a building with a name over it. The church is a people. Like I said a few months ago, Israel is not a land, but Israel is a people. It's a group of people. God named them Israel. That is their name. That's who they are. They happen to live in a land that we call Israel as well. But we are a people. The church is a people. It's a group of people. And as the church operates together under an awe and an honor of the Lord, he begins to affect culture. And we all know for years and years and years there have been more division among us than there's been any coming together. And in that, we've separated ourselves and we've, we've had that two-year mentality that we talked about in Jeremiah 28, the two-year mentality of, well, we're just going to go see Jesus one day, so it doesn't matter what happens in our culture. And we have abdicated our responsibility within the culture. And so we see things happening in our schools, and in our government, and in our cities that are not godly at all, not how we were formed and fashioned and who we were called to be. And the church has to begin to engage in the culture Today, because Christ lives in us, we are the temple of the God. We are the church. We're the church. The church is the embassy operating with God's kingdom authority in a foreign land. You are the embassy of God. You are the one that represents God. The church is the place where the rules of eternity operate at a location of history. We gather together as the church so that we can hear from heaven, so that we can live out heaven's viewpoint in the world. That we would gather together to hear from heaven. We come here today to hear from heaven so that we might go out and represent heaven's viewpoint and release it to the culture. I want to look at a couple verses in Hebrews chapter 12, and then I'll get to 2 Corinthians 5 in a minute. And in Hebrews chapter 12, um, it it says this, starting in, in verse 18. And it says, For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. They are talking about when they went to Mount Sinai. And God revealed himself there. And when God revealed himself on the mountain, it actually evoked fear and terror in the people. And then if they touched the mountain, they were going to die. It's the place where the law was delivered to the people at Mount Sinai. Here's the thing about the law. The law does not bring comfort. Does it ever bring comfort? When you see the law, does it bring comfort to you? When you see, when you're driving down the road and you're not quite sure how fast you're going, you see a police officer, do you have that little jump in your heart? Like, what am I doing? The law simply does not bring comfort. But that doesn't mean the law is bad. You know, it's not not all bad. Some parts about the law we would think would be very good. They're even in our written in our laws, like do not kill, do not steal. Those are things written in our laws from God's law, from the Ten Commandments that were handed down. Those are not bad things. Those are good moral things. But there's a few things about the law that that are that we don't agree that's hard for us. Like maybe the first one honor the Lord your God. Put him first in your life. Honor Jesus. And some of us are like, oh, well, don't make a law out of that one. Make a law out of that do not kill thing and that do not steal thing. But don't make a law out of honor the Lord. And and that one about keeping the Sabbath and making it holy, let's don't make a law out of that. Because that that confronts us, right? Those things begin to confront us. But if you're a thief, the law would confront you as a thief. The law can only identify our weaknesses and indict us. Mount Sinai represents the law that indicts us. We don't, we don't want to cl- climb Mount Sinai. And so in Hebrews, that's what it's saying, that they went, and you don't want to go climb Mount Sinai. That's where people were afraid and terror of God. But listen to what it says after that, talking about another mountain. In verse 22, it says, Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, a festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn, whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all 
to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. There is only one mediator, a mediator. There's only one that makes things right between man and God. That is Jesus. Don't let anybody ever deceive you. There's only one on the face of the earth who ever came to make things right between you and God, and it's Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. Jesus' blood was better than the blood at the sacrifice. Mount Zion represents the new covenant, the new covenant in Jesus. Only through him are the spirits of righteous people made perfect. Only through Jesus. Only Jesus can make you everything God wants you to be. And when we as individuals know what God has made us to be, as a group collectively, we'll begin to influence the culture in a new way. Some of us, now listen, it is hard because we look at the downward slide of our culture, right? We look at the darkness that's around us, and it's just like, why even try? Just give up. But we cannot give up because there are too many lives at stake. There are too many people that don't know Jesus. There's too many lost people. And how we view them is so important in our lives. We cannot back down. We have got to engage the culture. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And there's some interesting things here. I'm going to read a couple verses to you. In verse 5 it says this, Now the one who prepared us for the very purpose is God. God has prepared you for a purpose, who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. That's just good to know, that you have the Spirit of God as a down payment. If you are born again, you have the Spirit of God within you, and that Spirit of God actually marks you. It's the God factor within you that you know you're a believer. No matter how much somebody wants to come argue with you and lie to you and tell you the Word doesn't exist and tell you all these falsities about God, no. I have the Spirit of God as a down payment in my heart. I know who God is. You're not going to argue with me. You're not going to argue me out of things. You're not, your, your lack of wisdom in the Word and your lack of knowledge of the Word is not going to argue things out of me that I've experienced with God. That's the Spirit of God as a down payment in your life. Verse 11 says this, Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord... The fear of the Lord, the honor, the respect, the awe, the, that God is the supreme being. We try to persuade people. We try to, our responsibility is to persuade people. We're supposed to be a light to them. A light in the darkness. We are called to be a salt in this world. Whoever we're around, our lives should be persuading them to come to know Jesus. They should see God living in us that they would want him. Verse 14, it says this, For the love of Christ compels us, since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died, and he, Jesus, died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Because Jesus has marked you, who do you live for? Who are you called to live for? Jesus. You're called to live for Jesus. He died for you. And it said that, I mean, that should just really, it, it just should go off inside of us. Those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. And just a couple more verses, starting in verse 16. From now on, from now on, because we don't live for ourselves anymore, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. From a worldly perspective. Think about the people you're going to encounter today that you've already got preconceived notions about. Anybody going to go see a family member today that maybe they don't want to go see? A yeah, spam caller on your phone? Anybody going to go, like, you know, venture a store today and, you know, be frustrated by who may or may not be there? When we view people through a worldly perspective, we walk into that with judgment with offense, with frustration, with, and it says, listen, we can't view people with a worldly perspective. We have to view them from a heavenly perspective. What's that mean? They know Jesus, they don't know Jesus. 
And if they don't know Jesus, why do we expect them to live like they do know Jesus? Why do we just want those that don't know Jesus to clean up their morality so that we're happy because they're not offending us anymore with their immorality? The more immorality that we see with those that don't know Jesus should be compelling us to share Jesus with them so they would come to know Jesus so that then they could live right before God because they've been made right before God. Paul is saying we can't view people with a worldly perspective. We have to view them from a heavenly perspective. Otherwise, we'll have no opportunity to be a light in their life. When you walk into a room and you've already got judgment on your heart, you cannot lead them to Jesus. We do not view anyone from a worldly perspective, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him this way. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Aren't you thankful that you are no longer your old man? You are no longer defined by that old person? The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not who I used to be. Now, it's one thing to say I'm not who I used to be. It's another thing that the fruit in your life, people say, you're not who you used to be. Sometimes we want to defend ourselves and say, oh, that's, not who I, uh, that's not who I am anymore. But the truth is, when you're living for Jesus, they're going to say, you're not who you used to be. Why are you not like who you used to be? Huh, let me tell you. Let me tell you about the man who changed my life forever. Let me tell you about Jesus. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and see, the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Our ministry is one of reconciliation where we're helping bring the divide together. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Our message is that the, the, the trespasses that you've committed, God is no longer counting them against you when you receive Jesus. That's the message that we get to give. And it says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Worship team, come up. Listen, our perspective changes when you begin letting that thing, the Spirit of God, lead you. Your perspective begins to change. And when you let that thing lead you, you begin to walk out your new identity of who you are in Christ which gives you an opportunity to bring reconciliation to the world. The message of reconciliation, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. That's the message. And then we're called to be ambassadors. We've become an officially designated representative authorized to speak in a foreign land. To speak in a foreign land. This is not our home. This is not our home. Heaven is our home. But you've been authorized to speak in this land. You have been authorized by Christ to speak on his behalf. On behalf of the place where you come from, heaven. We're called to bring heaven to earth. Jesus prayed that it would be on earth as it is in heaven. That the peace of heaven, the joy of heaven, the life of heaven would be happening all around us. God desires that all people would hear and understand the gospel so that they might have the opportunity to believe for eternal life. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, it says this, God wants everyone, say everyone, everyone. to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Everyone. That crazy uncle, that weird aunt, that gossip, that neighbor, that coworker. he wants everyone to come to them. And it starts with me. And then it becomes we. And we have an opportunity to influence the culture. Think about that verse we read just a minute ago. God makes his appeal. His appeal. The appeal from God. He makes his appeal through us. Me and you, we get to make the appeal of heaven right here for him. We make the appeal. The church, we've been pulled out of slavery into freedom. 
the Israelites for generations, what did they do? And for hundreds and years, they remembered over and over and they proclaimed, we once were slaved, but God delivered us and set us free. We once were, but God delivered us and set us free. We've been pulled out of bondage. We've been made free. Our freedom is to be shouted through the lives of our culture. We're free from the sin and its punishment, and we should display it. We should shout it. We should live it. We should tell the world about it. The culture is changed when the church lives in freedom. We have to live in freedom. We can't be in bondage anymore. We can't be half of who we are called to be. But we are called to live in freedom. And when the church lives in the freedom it's called to be, the culture has no opportunity except for to respond and change. Come on, stand with me today. Here's a couple things. Let's, let's, let's say these things. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. free. If the Son sets you free, you are truly free. For the Lord is spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom! Come on, sing this with us before we go. Come on.